And now we transition to our formal streamed worship. Um, as you know, if you parked in the back of the building, the barbecue, the chicken barbecue is today after church, and we're encouraging everyone to participate. But there is time. Food will not be available until noon, so there will be time to indeed join John in Fellowship Hall and share some thoughts and enthusiasm. Um, next Sunday is World Communion Sunday. We will also receive our peacemaking offering that day. And you'll hear more about that next week, but I wanted to point out that the local portion of that peacemaking offering has been designated for In My Father's Kitchen, which is about a third of the offering. If you are not able to be here next week and would like to contribute, there are envelopes in the pews to do that. And certainly want to welcome John Tomino. I'm excited about his presence here. There's a detailed biography of him and Leanne in your bulletins. But John and Leanne Tamino founded In My Father's Kitchen about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, and do an awesome ministry with the homeless in Syracuse. And I've heard John talk before, which was also very effective preaching. And so I'm looking forward to this morning with all of you. Let us continue with our greeting of peace. And may the peace of Christ be with you. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't. I'm actually getting a hot flash, but thank you for the reminder. Um, we're on the Salmon River. And it's King Salmon time, so it's the big place. But they were jumping all around the world. People of God, we come to this place so that through our worship, by the power of the Spirit and reflection on the Word of God, we might move cl closer to who we are created to be and become more faithful followers of Christ. Together, let us worship the Lord.
Let us be in prayer. God of amazing grace, with humility, we give thanks for the region in which we live, where nature's disasters are less prevalent. We give thanks for the safe, warm homes we have, which you have bestowed on us through no earning of our own. May our gratitude show forth in the ways we seek to serve those near and far who have no homes, no shelter, and no warmth, so that your glory might be revealed in our ministry. Amen. With gratitude on our lips, let us confess the ways we fail to demonstrate that gratitude in our daily living, that we might make our thanks a living thing. Let us confess together. Merciful God, too often we focus on what we do not have instead of the gifts which have been bestowed on us. Too often we evaluate our neighbors according to what we think they should have achieved instead of simply responding to their need. Forgive us. By the power of your spirit, expand our hearts and hands with compassion and generosity. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, for us there is good news. In Christ we are forgiven and are empowered to become the disciples we so greatly desire to be. Having received this great grace, let us make our offerings of thanksgiving and praise.
Gracious and ever-giving God, we make our offerings this day with full hearts and high hopes, returning this portion of your giving for our work in your Son's name. We pray that you guide us in our actions, words, and deeds, and in the use of all things you have placed at our command or under our care. May our spirits always be grateful, and may our stewardship always be faithful. In Christ's name, we serve and we pray. Amen. God's word to us today begins with the responsive reading portions of Psalm 72. Please join me as we consider God's word. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to a king's son. May all kings fall down before him, all nations give him service. From oppression and violence, he redeems their life, and precious is their blood in God's sight. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. With the psalmist praise on our lips, let us raise our voices in praise for God's enduring word. John has asked me to read the reading from Luke that begins with chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. Let us listen to God's word for us on this day. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. God always blesses the reading, the hearing, the understanding, and especially the living of the Holy Word. Good morning, Good morning. my brothers and sisters. I'm so excited to be here. I bring greetings on behalf of my wife, Leanne. Uh, we just got back from Colorado from a 10-day getaway. That's my wife's home state. And uh, it was just a lot for her this past weekend, getting the house back in order. And so she's resting at home and I'm here on her behalf. So she's co-founder with me of In My Father's Kitchen. Um, I was thinking on the way in this morning, as I was thinking and taking the drive in, I started to see the leaves changing. And uh, that brings me great excitement. You said you were excited about the fall. I love October. October is my favorite month of the whole year. But I was thinking about as I was driving in, to Fayetteville, you know, that Syracuse is just above sea level. And just last week, I was 14,000 feet above sea level. So I was thinking, wow, you know, three miles up, I was, that's where I was 10 days ago. And it made me think about perspective. 
on the way in as I was kind of thinking about what I was going to share with you guys today. And, um, you know, Jesus always pulled away by himself uh, to get with the Father, to get perspective. And for me and Leanne last week, we got 10 days of a getaway to a higher elevation to get clarity and uh, more understanding, not just in relaxing with each other in Colorado, but also fellowshipping. And I remember my morning walks in the mountains with the Lord. I found this hidden sanctuary up on the mountain, about 10,000 feet. There was a, I come across this path and there's a cross with pews and it's in the middle of the woods. And I was amazed to, to for me, it was like the Lord always finds you no matter where you're at. And uh, it, it just brought me clarity coming back to Syracuse, ready to hit the ground running again. We've been doing this for 12 years, and I thank God we had a wonderful team now that was able to do the work while we were gone. In the very beginning days when we were gone, the work stopped. But since we've reduplicated ourselves and our staff now, we're able to continue the work as Leanne and I got a time of refreshing. Why do I say all that? It's about perspective. And the message that I wanted to talk to you today about was, who is your neighbor? And I'm going to read a passage out of Luke again, and it's in chapter 10. And I'm going to start in actually verse 25. It says, one day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. So here we go. Jesus is getting tested. Have we ever been in a test ourselves, right? Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Can we say that together? Love my neighbor as myself. Love my neighbor as myself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. Now remember, they were testing him. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? That's the title of my message. And let's see what Jesus says, then, who the neighbor is. Verse 30, Jesus replied with a story. And I'm going to tell you some stories today, too. And I'm going to talk, or so 20 minutes is like, you guys are really putting me in a box. <laughs> so I'm going to be as best as I can. So uh, Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest, everyone say a priest. A priest came along, and when he saw the man lying there, he crossed over the other side of the road and passed him by, a priest. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. So someone who worked in the church seen this guy there and walked past him and walked on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If the bill runs even higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. So this guy's going above and beyond the call of duty, and he was a despised Samaritan. The priest walked by, the assistant walks by from the temple, but yet this despised person is going above and beyond the call of duty. Now, which of these would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, you now go and do the same. So they asked him, who is my neighbor? And Jesus goes into this wonderful story because he was the master storyteller. And he closes this not by answering the question, but asking them, will you be neighborly to those around you? You must be neighborly not looking for who I should be good to, who deserves it. Just be good to those who are around you. Will you be neighborly? Who was the one who was the neighborly person? That's a tough one when you think about it. Because there's people in our everyday lives that kind of rub us the wrong way, right? And we walk by the other side. Maybe it's a coworker who gets under your skin and 
everyone in the office talks about them, but you follow the same suit and you don't engage. You go on the other side of the office. Maybe it's a family member who's the black sheep in the family who just, just oh, there goes Joe again, or there goes Susie. You know, will you be neighborly to that loved one that no one else wants to be neighborly to? Because that's what Jesus is asking us to do. Maybe it's someone in your neighborhood, the, the person who's giving everyone a hard time and always complaining about everything and everyone avoids the neighbor, right? Oh, that's just Joe. How about being neighborly to Joe, the one who no one wants to be neighborly to? So today is kind of like a challenge because I was challenged 12 years ago. I'm going to share a little bit of the story of In My Father's Kitchen for maybe some of you who maybe have never heard how it started. I was running a restaurant, very successful one in Syracuse with my family, uh, opened it in 2002. And I remember in 2009, I was, Leanne and I are also licensed clergy as well, so we wear a spiritual cap as reverends as well. And I was doing my prayer time in 2009 in the restaurant in the morning before everyone showed up. That was my devotional time while I was working. And I felt like as I was working, I hear these words drop in my heart, just like in my father's kitchen, like came into my mind. And I was like, oh man, that just rings so well. And then I felt the calling to vocational ministry. I felt the Holy Spirit telling me, it's time to leave this behind and follow me in this endeavor. And I'm like, in my father's kitchen, like I'm, ta I'm having this conversation in my mind with the Lord. And I felt it was going to be a place that Leanne and I would still be able to use food as a vehicle to fill someone's belly. But then God's presence would come and change someone's heart. And I thought it was, I go, oh man, that sounds really awesome. And then I heard the words, as clergy gets the calling, it's time to leave the restaurant and follow me. And I was, it kind of felt like when Jesus was calling the disciples, you know, he just said, drop your net and follow me. And I just said, okay. So I go home and I counsel with my pastor and my wife, and we sit on it for 18 months. That was in 2009. In 2011, we finally walk away from the restaurant thinking we're going to be missionaries in Costa Rica using food as this vehicle to help the poor. Until I have this encounter as I'm coming down 81 South and I live on the north, so I'm getting off the Bear Street exit by Destiny USA, and there's a man holding a cardboard sign. I'm sure we've seen those individuals in our community, men or women. And I'm about four cars deep from the intersection, and I realize no one is looking at him. Everyone's like kind of looking straight ahead, especially if you're that first car. That's very awkward if someone's right by your car window. And I just heard in my heart, he thinks he's invisible. I see him, and I want you to go feed him. So I'm like, okay. So I go to Wegmans, and I get a sandwich and cookies and water. Remember, this ties into who's my neighbor, and will you be neighborly? I get to back to the intersection 20 minutes, later, 20 minutes later, he's still there. Now my heart's like pounding. My hands are sweaty. You know, who's ever gotten to that place where you know you're supposed to do something, you get a little nervous when it's time to act. And I park my car. I just don't do drive-by. And I walk over to him, and I introduce myself to him. I said, hey, man, my name's John. What's your name? He goes, my name is Tim. I said, Tim, I have a lunch here. Would you like it? He goes, I'm starving. So I hand him the lunch, and this is what I say to him. I say, Tim, I just have to tell you one thing. He goes, what's that? The Lord wanted me to tell you that you're not invisible, that he sees you, and I see you as well. And I hand him the lunch. And as soon as I tell him he's not invisible, he takes this deep breath in, and then he exhales, like visibly. I could see him doing it. And then his whole body kind of like shudders when he exhales, because I feel like nobody sees me. And then he proceeds to unpack his life story. 20 minutes, I'm standing on this off-ramp at Bear Street Traffic Light at 81 South, forgetting, I forgot that I'm on a corner off-ramp with traffic going around me, because I'm in this intimate moment with this gentleman who's unpacking this tragic story to me uh, over like a 20 year period. And all of a sudden when he's done, I kind of come out of the stupor that I'm in in this moment. And I realize, oh my God, I'm on a corner here. Like, this is like crazy. And I had this moment with this man and with God, with the spirit of the living God, with Tim. And I go home, I say to my wife, Leanne, I said, Leanne, I think I know what we're supposed to do with our lives. We're supposed to go find these individuals, tell them that they're not invisible, feed them and, you know, that, and I don't know what's going to happen. And then the question is, how are we going to do it? So all I knew was I had a talent as a chef. I'm a chef, so I had a talent for cooking. I had a kitchen in my house, and I had a little car. We just left the restaurant world, 
And my mom thought I was crazy. My brothers thought I lost my mind. How are you going to live? And I'm like, I don't know. We're just going to follow the Lord. And that's how it started with that one encounter. And then started going out the next day, making wonderful lunches as a chef, like lasagna, and linguine alfredo, and steak wraps, bring ratcheted up lunches to individuals who no one wants to look at. So go back to who is my neighbor? Will you be neighborly? I think before that encounter, I might have just drove by like everybody else. But something struck me. The Holy Spirit hit me. And thinking back about Colorado and the mountains and how when I found that little sanctuary hidden at 10,000 feet, God knows where we're at. And God knows our heart. And he knows our talents. There's a scripture that says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. All of us have a desire in our hearts to be neighborly. But when it comes to putting feet to our faith, sometimes we back off the line. I, let the next person will be the nice person. I don't have to engage that person. When maybe God is striking something within your heart, to go out of your comfort zone. Because for Leanne and I, we had to leave our comfort zone to be neighborly to someone who didn't look very neighborly, looked kind of scary, looked kind of intimidating. But our God that we serve and we say we serve, we're in this building saying that we're worshiping a God of all creation, resides within us if we believe in him and he wants to use his people to manifest his kingdom into the earth. Leanne and I said yes to that. Was it scary? Yeah, it was a little nerve-wracking. Was it challenging? Yep. But was it worth it? Absolutely worth it. The amazing thing is that Leanne and I thought we were going to go help people and change their lives, which is true, but something happened to us at the same time. I don't know if anybody's ever been on the mission field or done a mission trip, you come back changed when your eyes see something and your ears hear things that you only heard about outside. But when you experience that something happens within your heart, the living God, the burning fire, the burning bush starts to burn within you. That little ember that was in there starts to roar like a fire and you feel like, I have to go do something. And that's what Leanne and I have encountered. We touch the fire, the fire of God. We are being neighborly to those that are around us. And I'm going to give you a little story. In 2013, so before I tell you the story, we've assisted now 312 people that were once homeless, now housed, right? Pastor read that passage about the one lost sheep. You know, Jesus will leave the 99 to go find the one. And for Leanne and I, those 312 started with one, then it went to two, and then it went to three, and now we're up to 312 with the Lord's help, not John and Leanne. There's a movie, Hacksaw Ridge, that I love, and it's about this medic who's up on this ridge that was, like, unpenetrable. And he, at the, there's wounded all over the place, and he would go out and get one and come back and go, just one more. He was a believer, and he would go out and grab another one, just one more. Next thing you know, there's 100 guys saved, but it was one at a time. And that's how we do it at In My Father's Kitchen. So in 2013, I met, I meet this gentleman and his two brothers that were all three were homeless living outdoors. And um, his name was Kevin. It was Kevin, Robert, and Mark. They're three brothers homeless. Kevin, they're all using drugs, uh, crack cocaine and other different kinds of things. Uh, some mental health stuff and in, in wrapped in the whole stuff as well. And Robert was the first one to really engage and buy into what we were doing as we were being neighborly to him for letting us help him on his journey to housing gets housed. Mark, the youngest one in October of 2014, was trying to stay warm in an abandoned house. Him and another guy went into this building. They took the plywood off a window. They went into the house and they built a fire pit in the kitchen of this abandoned house. And the fire got out of control, and they were trapped inside the house. They couldn't exit the way they came in because that's where the fire was roaring. So they both perished inside this house. So Robert, one brother's indoors. Mark dies in an abandoned house fire. The other gentleman 
survives the fire but was in brain it was brain dead and the family was going to donate some of his organs so they called us in that we do last rites on this individual in the hospital and then they unplug the machine and he perishes as well so kevin is the lone brother now that was still outside one's perished one's indoors and kevin's still wandering outside and so and we're loving him we're being neighborly to him we're telling him he's not invisible bringing lunches and clothing and all kinds of things to him and he used to panhandle by TLAB off ramp to 690 and Midler in that area. And that's where the Salvation Army has this ARC where the guys go to this, or women could go to live and try to get their lives turned around. And we used to share with him the hope of Jesus while we were on the streets with him. One day he's walking by the Salvation Army Rehab Center and he's walking by, and this is his story telling me, something compelled me to go in there. He didn't, he just felt like he had to go into the building. He goes in there and he surrenders himself to the Salvation Army's program, seven month program to, for rehab. He calls me while he's in there and says, John, I wanna let you know what happened. And he tells me the story and he goes, I want you to be my mentor. I want you to assist me through this journey. So we do that, we visit him. He uh, graduates that program. We help him get into his first apartment. He volunteers with me as a, my right-hand guy. He starts uh, work, we got him his first job working. And then we started this higher ground program five years ago. It's a day labor program for folks who panhandle. And we needed a van driver. And I knew who I wanted. I wanted my friend, Kevin. So I asked Kevin, he's working for Capaco Paper, who he was working for. And I said, Kevin, I have this opportunity for you. Do you think you'd like to work for us and do this work? And he said, he jumped on it like that. So it's five years later, Kevin's working for me right now. He's our higher ground supervisor of our van program. Here's a man who is homeless, hooked on crack cocaine. Brother dies in a fire. Robert was indoors, but never kind of transformed his life around and is still struggling to this day with untreated mental health and drug addiction, but is housed. Um, so he's successfully in, but not having a successful life, I would say. But Kevin's whole life turned around. And the difference between the three of them was Kevin embraced and touched the fire, the fire of the Holy Spirit. And when you commit yourself and touching the holy fire, something happens. You are purged. You are cleansed. You are changed. And Kevin's life was transformed. How did that happen? Because Leanne and I, were neighborly to those who no one wanted to look at. So I think the challenge, and I'm gonna end with this for us today. First of all, we appreciate your support towards us. We are your hands extended into the community. You are being neighborly to the community as a, commu as a, as a local body, giving to In My Father's Kitchen and other agencies that you guys support within our community. You guys are reaching out from Fayetteville into the community. But my, my challenge to you today now is on the individual level. It's easy to be neighborly as a corporate group, right? Oh yeah, we're all doing it together. But I wanna challenge you today, because I'm always challenged. I'm, I'm my worst, hardest critic. I'm always, Lord, purge me, cleanse me from the thing that's unrighteous. Show me the things within me that need to change so that I could be more like you. That's my desire, right? I'm challenging you today. When you leave this place today, who is your neighbor? Will you be neighborly to the one who no one wants to be neighborly to? Is it your next door neighbor? Is it your coworker? Is it someone in your family? What about just being neighborly to the, the person in front of you at the grocery store who's taking a long time and you're getting aggravated? Or you're driving down the highway and you feel road rage raging up within you. How about being neighborly and just take a breath? Say, Holy Spirit, let me be neighborly today. I believe if we go inside and look for those things, you will be neighborly in a greater perspective. And you know what? The amazing thing is you're going to bless someone's life. You're going to show and manifest the kingdom of someone, but something's going to happen inside of you. You're going to look for more opportunities to be neighborly. That's what ends up happening. My last statement is this. One of the things I've learned is, you know, when we, we're going to eat at 12 o'clock, right? It's all that wonderful chicken out there. It smells so awesome coming in. As human beings, we could eat to this place of being full, like Thanksgiving, you have to back away from the table. You've eaten so much, you just can't eat anymore. The amazing thing spiritually 
in God's kingdom, the more you eat, the hungrier you become. Naturally speaking, the more you eat, the fuller you become, and you have to pull away. You have to stop or you're going to vomit, right? With the Holy Spirit, the more you partake of him, the more you drink of him, the more you eat of him, the more you want of him. It's like this, this unrelenting appetite of wanting more of God. Why do we want that? We want to shine our light so that the world may see that there's a heavenly Father in heaven. And with your support, together, we are building hope and changing lives in central New York. So will you go and be neighborly today and every day? God bless you guys, and thank you for your time. Let us be gathered in prayer. Compassionate God, we do draw near to you in prayer and pause to remember the blessings you bestow on us and all good things with which we dwell. From a centered gratitude, our thoughts and prayers spread to those who are in need of the service, the hope, the blessing, and the neighborliness we might bear into their lives. The people near us who feel invisible.
the people in and around the world whose lives and livelihoods have been devastated by storms and floods. all the people in our own communities and around the nation who live always on the edge, not having to wait for a natural disaster to blight their lives and joy, who garner no attention except negative attention, whose need is not perceived or are, who de or are deemed responsible for their circumstances. While in recent days we have focused on the violence of nature's work, we tremble too at the potential for violence and devastation by the nations. We pray for the leaders of every nation, for the ones who work for peace and justice. Grant them wisdom and a will to work with others for the best of all. Touch us with your spirit, Lord, that we might touch those around us, and so change the world and be changed ourselves. We pray with these words, with the silent meditations of our hearts, and the words Jesus taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. And let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.